It's Monday, and you know what that means. Jersey First TV proudly brings to you the latest edition of Real Talk. And yes, I am New Jersey's premier award-winning journalist, Top 50 Latino, as voted on by the Latino Spirit Online Magazine, certainly the weapon of mass disruption in Garden State Media. And from what I hear, the people's choice and the people's voice, and of course, ladies and gentlemen, you know it, the most handsome face that runs the place. It is me, Fernando Uribe. Happy Monday to you all, ladies and gentlemen. This the 28th of August in 2023. Summer's about to wrap up, thank the Lord. I'm more of a fall guy. Can't wait for the NFL to start. The leaves start changing. And of course, Halloween is right around the corner. And of course, I want to thank you all for tuning in from wherever. And however, you may be doing so right now on Facebook Live via StreamYard. Also on the Jersey First YouTube page. And certainly, of course, on LinkedIn. And speaking of all the social media platforms out there, ladies and gentlemen, always remember to make sure that you like Real Talk with Fernando Uribe and Jersey First on Facebook. Follow us both on Instagram and Twitter, of course, at the Fernando Zone and also at Jersey First. Click that subscribe button, ladies and gentlemen. It takes two seconds to do so, and you'll be obviously made aware of all the great programming brought to you by Jersey First. And of course, wherever you get your podcast, whether it's Spotify or SoundCloud, Download Jersey first and take all of our episodes with you as we're wrapping up the summer months. Maybe you're going to Tiki Mondays next week during Labor Day weekend. Maybe you're visiting the in-laws. Hey, maybe you're helping to move in your kids to college campuses, which can be a little challenging or whatever it is you're doing, folks, in the remaining days of summer. Hey, take Jersey first TV with you at all times throughout the summer of 2023. And I cannot say enough, folks, how proud I am to be a part of the dream team of Garden State Media. That's right, ladies and gentlemen. It is Jersey First TV, of course, always educating and advocating for the people of New Jersey. Brand new episodes premiere every single week, of course, on Thursdays. Brand new episodes of the Nader Narrative hosted by the incredible Elizabeth Nader air every Thursday via Jersey First, of course, on jerseyfirst.org slash TV. And of course, also on Facebook, as well as the Jersey First YouTube page. Also, brand new episodes of Bridging the Gap with Millennial Conservatives. A.J. Malilo and Stephen Rombolo also premiere on Thursdays as well. Check out the website I just mentioned, of course, for the start and end times. And, of course, on Monday nights, ladies and gentlemen, brand new episodes live every Monday. Our Real Talk with Fernando Uribe come to you again on Monday nights. Folks, I'm listen, unlike other journalists in New Jersey that barely work during the summer, if not the entire year, I don't take a break on this program, and that's why the traffic is so good. Folks, a lot to obviously talk about traffic a little bit later in the show. You definitely want to stick around for final thoughts. I have a lot to say about my alma mater, Rutgers University, and of course, all the useless journalists that really aren't doing their jobs in New Jersey. And you know what? I guess I have to be the grown up in the room and be doing their jobs for them. But I'll be talking about that and much more during final thoughts, folks. And uh, certainly before we begin, obviously, we have a lot to get to this evening. But I want to take this moment right now, ladies and gentlemen, to extend my sincerest condolences to David Cruz and his family on the passing of his mother. Certainly everyone here at Real Talk and at Jersey First TV want to extend once again our sincerest condolences and our thoughts and prayers uh, to the Cruz family. Uh, certainly it is not easy losing a loved one at any time of the year uh, from what we can tell, obviously, uh, the mother of David Cruz lived a very long and fulfilling life. And despite any differences I may have with David Cruz, I'm sure that his mom looks at David, the success that he's become, obviously, one of the few Hispanics and Latinos doing journalism on a statewide basis. So uh, without a doubt, obviously, uh, our thoughts and prayers and once again, our sincerest condolences go out to David Cruz on the passing of his mother. Stay strong, David, and also to everyone in your family. Stay strong during these difficult days. All right, ladies and gentlemen, certainly here on the program, as I mentioned, obviously traffic remains strong because not just of interesting dialogue, obviously always being educational, entertaining, and empowering here on the program. Folks, it's also because of the outstanding guests that I bring you every single week and the exclusives that you see every single week here on Jersey First that other news sites do not bring you. And certainly this week is no exception. My guest tonight live, ladies and gentlemen, he is the distinguished state senator, out of the 13th Legislative District, down you know, a little bit near the Jersey Shore line, folks. And he's a big fan of the show. He's my good friend. Declan O'Scanlan joins us here on Real Talk. Senator, how are you? Andrew, I'm doing very well. How are you? I'm doing well, Senator. And again, it's a 
a privilege to have you on here. And uh, folks, again, sharing is caring. Click that share button right now if you just join us live here on Jersey First TV, as my guest tonight is the state senator out of the 13th legislative district, Declan O'Scallion. Folks, just for informational purposes, in case you're not aware, according to recent information, again, the senator will be happy to correct me if I'm wrong, the 13th legislative district is covering multiple municipalities down in Monmouth County. Townships include Aberdeen, the Atlantic Highlands Borough, Fairhaven, Hazlitt, Highlands Borough, Homedale, Keensburg, Keyport, Little, Little Silver Borough, Marlboro Township, Middletown, Monmouth Beach Borough, Oceanport Borough, Rumson, Seabright Borough, and Union Beach Borough. I could be wrong, but folks, very nice municipalities down the Jersey shoreline. Senator, did I get any of them wrong or are we missing something after the census? I think you got them. Well, no, after the census, we're going to trade Fairhaven and pick up West Long Branch. Okay. So that was the only change that will happen technically as of the day that, God willing, I win re-election and I'm, I'm sworn into a new term. That change will happen. But look, we, we get calls from people all over Monmouth County. So I kind of consider myself a Monmouth County senator. I think my counterpart, uh, Democrat Vin Gopal, does as well. Uh, but it's a great area to live. Uh, the Bay Shore is full of really wonderful, wonderful people. Uh, we have great demographics. Uh, and, and, and really wonderful people. And we run the gamut from uh, socioeconomically as well. So it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun. It it's certainly is. And, and we'll get to where it resides in Jersey. Is it North Jersey, now Central Jersey maybe, or South Jersey? We'll get to that later. I'm really interested in your take on that. Okay. Uh, but first, Senator, uh, I'll tell you, the timing for you to come on this show could not have been more perfect. I'm not sure if you had a chance to catch last week's episode uh, but during my final thoughts, I went after my alma mater, Rutgers University, and it pains me because I am as devoted an alumnus as, as it comes. I wear my merch during the winter. I wear my scully during shoveling snow. I wear my T-shirts during the summer. I like going to basketball games. I'm Mr. Rutgers, okay? I wear red all the time. It's my favorite color. I love my days during my undergraduate studies in New Brunswick. I love my graduate days in Newark. Again, I'm as Rutgers as it comes, but I have to be intellectually honest here. When Rutgers is wrong, I'm going to call him out. And what you've been doing, I applaud because, again, it's late August. Parents are moving their kids back to college campuses all across this country, here in, here in New Jersey specifically. And Rutgers continues with this, what I would call a ridiculous, I, I, I could say something else, but it's a family program, a ridiculous vaccine mandate that we all know, I'm sorry, it just doesn't make any sense. And it, shame on the state university center. No question, uh, Fernando. We share that that thought, uh, and I would say that that making these arguments isn't anti Rutgers. It's because we love the institution that we want to stop these incompetent administrators from destroying the institution's credibility, which is what they're doing with this ridiculous anti-science mandate. It doesn't matter whether you believe in vaccines or not. Let's say you do, and I happen to believe that vaccines uh, play a pretty valuable role. Before you go mandating such, such medications, it, the science has to make sense. At the very least, the, the vaccine has to be sterilizing and, and the mandate will have to protect other people from your choice to get it, your, in, your action or inaction. That absolutely isn't the case with the COVID vaccine. Uh, so again, even if there's folks watching that tend to be pro-vaccine, you still can and should be against this policy anywhere actually mandating this particular vaccine. It does not make sense. It is ludicrous. Uh, it, it Mandating vaccine protects no one uh, other than perhaps the person that gets it. And we also know now that virtually everybody has been exposed to COVID. So uh, getting vaccine or booster right now, uh, especially with the evolution of, of COVID, it, it makes absolutely no sense. And it's even more nonsensical because Rutgers isn't mandating the most up-to-date boosters. They're mandating just a vaccine at some point, the original vaccine, which we know now actually plays very little role in even protecting the person that might get it. It is such such science-contradicting policy. Uh, it really does destroy the credibility of the Rutgers administrators making these decisions, and that destroys the credibility of the institution. It is supposed to be the premier science-based institution of yeah. higher education, public institution of higher education yeah. in the state. And they have no business mandating this. And we found out today they have disenrolled dozens of students 
And that is a really big problem. We now know that this policy is negatively impacting these, these kids' plans for their education. And that's outrageous. I agree with you completely. And it's, it's, it's absurd on the part of President Holloway and the administration to not take a stand on this. And it's funny because during COVID, during that spring, summer of 2020, right, Rutgers was leading the way as, the, as a major science university in this country about vaccinations and about science. And now it just seems like they're talking out of both sides of their mouth. And I think it's disgraceful and shame on President Holloway Shame on the administration for not even wanting to address this. It's sort of like they've gone, they've disappeared quicker than a virgin on prom night when it comes to even having any accountability here, Senator. And I think it's it's a disgrace because over the summer, we also saw that the faculty, adjuncts, staff members were fighting hard for a new contract, which means ultimately tuition and fees are going to go up for parents and students collectively. And you would think for, you know what, for, for doing this, Hey, how about some accountability? So, I mean, shame on Rutgers. And again, I mean, I'm just sort of going by a statement you put up by your legislative district here on the page. I mean, you called the administration of Rutgers an embarrassment. I think you were being kind. Again, it's a PG program. It's a family show. I could think of worse things to call them over there because it's a bunch of overpaid bureaucrats over there in New Brunswick, in my opinion. Well, you could make that argument. And you can make the argument you know, whether they're overpaid or not because Rutgers has to compete with other institutions. We can have that debate, but they are failing. Uh, the, I think Rutgers is, is one of 1% of, of, of higher education facilities still requiring uh, vaccine mandates like this. Uh, that puts them at odds, again, with 99% of the other institutions. Uh, the problem is it's the premier institution of New Jersey where, where tens of thousands of uh, our uh, kids from New Jersey uh, aspire to go. Uh, and, and the fact that they're disenrolling those, and it's probably not a big number, but it's a number. And they are they are putting, not just putting at risk, actually, they are systematically destroying the credibility of the institution. Again, it's, it's a real problem. Uh, and again, today we confirm, I was sort of hoping we were backdoor winning this argument that Rutgers wasn't enforcing the mandate. But we found out today that Rutgers has admitted that they have disenrolled uh, students over this. I want to hear from those students, by the way, if any of your listen, listeners, we're not going to stop. We're going to keep going. Uh, and you're right, President Holloway, if he's not the driver of this policy, the fact that he is not taking a lead and and saying, no, we're not going to perpetuate this. Look, the, the wise thing to do here would have been when called out, when the case was made for Rutgers to say, you know what, you're right. It's an antiquated policy. We're going to back off. That I would have respected. I would have applauded them. But the fact that they're digging in uh, and, again, damaging these, the, the uh, credibility of Rutgers uh, and damaging these kids' uh, you know, well-thought-out educational plans, it's just outrageous to the point where now it's time to start thinking about new leadership at Rutgers. It's my understanding that, and they put the, the person defending the policies, the chief operating officer, Cataldo, I believe, uh, it's, it's my understanding he's kind of driving the policy. Uh, the other administrators should step in and say, I'm sorry, but you're wrong and override him. Uh, but whoever doesn't do that, whoever is pushing this policy should go at this point. And look, you, ma you mentioned that we added funds to support Rutgers when the, the contract was, was arrived at yeah. uh, that dramatically increased uh, compensation for uh, some administrators and, and educators as well, may very well have been deserved. But the fact that even more public money is going into this institution highlights even more that we all have stake in perpetuating and, and enhancing its reputation, not looking the other way while that reputation is destroyed. I'm with you, Senator. And, it, it, and isn't it funny about the emperor? He likes to pick and choose when to opine about things at Rutgers. You know, during the contract dispute between the faculty and the administration and adjuncts, everything, you know, the emperor, you know, a.k.a. Phil Murphy, you know, loves to opine about, well, people are being marginalized at Rutgers and people, you know, fair work, fair pay for fair work. Not a peep between flying back and forth to Italy for the emperor, but he's happy to opine during the summer about this, but not now. Again, one of many other disgraceful, disgraceful behaviors by the emperor, in my opinion, Senator, but more on the emperor later. I want to get your thoughts on on Phil Murphy in a little bit. But to sort of wrap up here, again, I, I applaud you 
for really taking a stand here. And I think that it's really a disservice where, you know, thousands of parents are moving their kids into campuses this weekend, right? This past weekend, if not, because classes for the most part start either today on a lot of college campuses, if not after Labor Day, it's a great time. You know, kids are moving away. I remember moving away to New Brunswick. I mean, it was a fulfilling time. You know, it's, it's our moment to make some history. It's our moment to sort of, you know, move on into the next step of our adolescence and into adulthood. Now you're, you're killing me now because I just dropped my, my daughter off for her freshman year of college okay, well, uh, last best, Sunday. I cried like life. a baby and I'm, I am excited for her for all those life milestones. I'm terrified for me that uh, sure. it means I'm getting old. No, uh, well, listen, again, best of luck to your daughter again, obviously, uh, as she begins her academic uh, progress and continues in it. It's just a shame to disenroll students for, for a mandate that we know doesn't work. And the idea that, again, Rutgers is the science university to just engage in this draconian behavior and tyrannical behavior, I think it's wrong. I think it's a black eye on Rutgers. Again, a publicly funded state university where you and your fellow legislators voted, okay, because Rutgers is subsidized by taxpayer dollars too. And yeah. the idea that they feel they can get away with this and not be held accountable, I think it's disgraceful. I think President Holloway needs to grow a spine and really hold people accountable. As you mentioned, the the, uh, the chief operating officer, officer at Rutgers University, that person needs to be held accountable as well as everyone else that goes along with this mainly, as far as I'm concerned, Senator. His, his public pronouncement was interesting. He didn't try to justify the policy. He didn't make practical arguments about the policy and its effectiveness. Uh, he came on and said, well, we're, we're putting this out there so these students who were they're planning on disenrolling can make other plans. Essentially saying, screw you. We don't care about your educational plans. We don't care that you're residents of New Jersey, that your parents pay taxes here in New Jersey, most of them anyway, the, the kids probably being disenrolled. It really was an awful, awful message to send. Uh, disgraceful. Uh, and, and really, again, I, I enhances, I think, my call that maybe it's time for new leadership in at least that role. Uh, I've also challenged him as of today to a, a debate on the merits of the policy. Let's have that. If he wants to make that argument, happy to do it. Um, I doubt where he's going to take me up on that. Senator, but, Senator let, let me moderate that debate. If it happens, please let me moderate that. I'd love to moderate that debate. That'd be fun. I'd be in, but I, I'm not, I'm not shaking in my boots that he's going to accept uh, my offer and shaking even less that he have any substance, substantive counter arguments to, to the points that you and I have made here on your show today. Uh, absolutely. Uh, more on Rutgers later, Senator. Let's get to some politics here. I mean, obviously it is political. We talked about to some extent, but uh, let's get to politics. November 7th is right around the corner. You, along with the other 119 legislators, are all on the ballot this November 7th. Uh, certainly Republicans, I would argue, have a real chance. Uh, maybe not up here where I live. It's as blue as Windex. But down in Central and South Jersey, Republicans have a real good opportunity to flip some districts as red as my jacket. And I think that there's a lot. The, the, the wind is at Republicans back this year. And we made some gains in, in 2021, certainly sending some new assembly people to the legislature. We had an upset, probably the biggest political upset I can remember in my adult life in New Jersey politics with uh, State Senator Ed Durr. By the way, folks, a coming up, you'll be a guest in, in the next few weeks, so stay tuned for that episode. Uh, certainly, that was a lot of momentum. I think that, you know, Jack should have won in 2021 if it wasn't for just, you know, sort of tribalism among Republicans where, you know, less than 40 percent of registered Republicans came out to vote. I think we'd have Governor Cittarelli today if, if some Republicans weren't so tribal and childish, to be honest with you. But in 2023, Republicans have a chance to make a dent into the majorities that Democrats have in the legislature, both in state assembly and the state Senate. You're up for re-election in a district that, for the most part, I mean, I'm just sort of looking at some registrations here, and we know that Republicans made some gains in the, la in the last year of registrations, but uh, it's still a predominantly, you know, Republican district, but a large percentage are unaffiliated independents. Um, obviously, 27% Democrats, 30, almost 31% re registered Republicans, 41% uh, unaffiliated, as I mentioned. Uh, how's campaigning going as you're on the campaign show, knocking on doors, talking to people, going with your running mates to you know, state fairs and festivals or whatever? What are the biggest issues that residents have brought to your attention during the campaign? 
Well, they're con they're concerned about uh, still some lingering COVID issues, which we've covered already. They're concerned with the state's energy policy and how it will affect them uh, from a, a practical perspective, what it will do to electric rates, what it will do to uh, the dependability of our grid, uh, how much it will add to the value of the, the, the or the money that they'll have to spend on a new car, which uh, this administration would have be an electric car. Uh, I, they're, they're concerned with uh, parental rights when it comes to their kids' education. And they're concerned, you know, as ever with the pocketbook issues of New Jersey being such an expensive place to live. And let me say, Republicans win on all of those fronts. Uh, we have really practical solutions to a lot of the, the challenges facing us. We just need a shot at, at taking control. And you're right, we do have a shot this year if people will come out and it is it's going to be an extraordinarily low turnout year no matter how much we scream uh, it, it's going to be that uh, which means there's opportunity you don't have to increase the percentage of participating republicans by all that much to make a real difference yeah. in, in a number of these districts we need people to do that we need people to talk to their neighbors bring people out uh, and vote republicans in and we can really challenge the administration going forward in the next two years we could challenge if we don't, I, I think we have a shot at overcoming Democrat legislative leadership. And they are worried, they're, they're coming our way on a number of these issues, um, uh, trying to, to, to back so that we don't hold them accountable. Uh, but we have a real shot here at, if not overwhelming them, coming very close and, and making Republicans much more relevant uh, at the policy debate table in New Jersey. Uh, so we're working hard on that. My district, you mentioned, does lean Republican. I'm very lucky about that. I like to think it's partly uh, because we're doing a good job and, and my constituents recognize that. Uh, we have some, some, Democrat, uh, some demographic uh, tailwinds as well, uh, which I'll take uh, all day. But we work really hard, me, my running mates, Jerry Scharfenberg and Vicki Flynn, to, to really be leaders in policy uh, in, in the vociferousness of our arguments, we try to be out there, uh, really try to make our, our constituents proud. Uh, that may sound uh, quaint in today's uh, politics of, of, of personal destruction, uh, but we really work hard uh, to, to have people say, you know, we're happy these people represent us. We also work very hard at constituent services. We have great staffs. Uh, we are really, really blessed. I'm knocking on wood right now of the consistency and confidence of our staffs. Uh, they make us look like we both we know what we're talking about uh, and and like we're uh, really amazingly effective uh, as well. So we thank them every day. Uh, but for all those reasons, people need to come out and they need to, to vote Republican this year. And then two years from now, we have another shot at the, go uh, the governor's office. Uh, we need to come out and do that. Absolutely. And folks, again, just for everyone at home, here's some numbers for you in the assembly right now it is a 46 to 34 majority for Democrats. And in the state Senate, it's 24 to 16. So again, between 2023 and 2025, there's a great opportunity for Republicans to shave into, the, into those majorities. And, and to your point, listen, I'm with you. Spending is out of control, okay? The budget is getting fatter than some of the latest Victoria's Secret models that they're hiring, whatever. I mean, it, it's absurd. I mean, we're talking about the highest property taxes in the country right now at an average of about $9,200, okay? Uh, the aspect about parental rights. And you know what, Senator? It's really funny to me. Uh, I'll be having uh, one of the Moms for Liberty uh, chapter presidents on next week on the show out of Bergen County. So I'm interested in talking to her. But isn't it funny how those on the left, and again, I don't want to start painting with a broad brush because, for example, where I live in Hudson County, my mayor is also my state senator. And Brian Stack is one of the more reasonable and sensible state senators that there are in the legislature. The problem is he's outnumbered by some of the, a lot of the woke fools that never took a biology course, clearly, and never took an economics course, clearly. And, you, and it shows because they're making decisions or, or taking public stances on things that, you know, quite frankly, are commonsensical. It's not about being white, black, Hispanic, Asian, whatever. Like the importance of parental rights, it's funny to me how far left Democrats in Trenton have politicized this to say, oh, people like Declan O'Scanlan or Fernando Uribe, because they stand for parental rights, they're blank phobes, blankists, and we're none of those things. We're just concerned about what we are exposing our kids to 
And that's not a bad thing. Uh, a lot of truth to that, Fernando. A lot to unpack there. But yes, I completely agree. Uh, and, you know, when it comes to, to parental rights, for instance, uh, specifically the, the new uh, policy out of Middletown, which is, is one of my towns, and Marlboro, another, uh, if you look at the policy, which has been tortured by the attorney general's office and this administration, uh, the policy is very reasonable. And look, I am I, an ally very frequently uh, of the LGBTQ community. I, I believe that, uh, look, and I have a lot of friends in that community. Uh, I've been endorsed by a number of folks in that community before. Um, all that having been said, uh, there are members of that community that are misrepresenting this policy as well. Uh, if the goal here is to arrive at good policy and to do it in a deliberative way, everybody needs to come to the table and have a discussion. That hasn't happened. Uh, the attorney general really hasn't had a discussion with these school districts, just came in uh, and, and sued them very quickly after they uh, initiated these policies. And they're very reasonable policies when you dig into it. No one is out. Uh, it's, it's simply uh, accommodating these kids and sharing where the law mandates that they share actually frequently uh, with parents how their kids have chosen to be treated. It's, it's pretty reasonable policy. Uh, and, and for that to be so bastardized, it does not surprise me at all that this recent poll we saw last week, that 77%, I think, on average parents agree with these policies. Now, again, they wouldn't agree, and parents dig into policy. They're, they're smart. They, they are, are, are intelligent about uh, uh, and, and do dig into uh, the policies affecting their children. They would not be agreeing if, if these policies weren't reasonable, at least not at those percentages. And a high percentage of Democrats agree with them as well. I'm with you. And it's it's astounding to me because, uh, you know, I'm surprised uh, Maddie hasn't blocked me on Twitter yet. But, you know, it, it seems like Maddie Placken, the attorney general, uh, also failed constitutional law because it seems he's so draconian also about responsible gun ownership and how that is important in New Jersey. Right, Senator? And the idea that, you know, does Maddie need to reread the Second Amendment again? Maddie, I got a copy of the Constitution right behind me if you want me to mail it to the attorney general's office. My God, bro. Like it's whether it's the, whether it's about the second amendment or whether it's about, you know, trying to freeze out parents or think that, you know, the measures, as you mentioned in those municipalities that happen to be in your district, somehow they're homophobic or transphobic. They're not, they're not being any, they're not being anything of the kind, but it's just funny where the emperor and Maddie and a lot of the far left, Democrats in Trenton, and even a lot of these activist groups, though, Senator, have, have really sort of just taken to social media to vilify regular people like you or I and other New Jerseyans where, hey, parents pay taxes. They pay property taxes, most likely. And newsflash, property taxes fund our public schools. They fund our school budgets in case someone needs a civics lesson on the show for anyone watching out there, especially my friends on the left. You know, parents going to school board meetings I mean, it, it's not a new thing, Senator, but the idea that parents are objecting to, hey, what their kids are exposed to. I mean, a case in point, listen, during Pride Month, I got called out by the mayor of Hoboken, um, Robbie Bala, because he decided to call me out on Twitter after I tweeted out some things about Pride Month, which I doubled and tripled down on, which were not malicious, which were none of it was homophobic or transphobic, but that's how people like on the left like to construe it. And it's funny where... He called me out. I decide to cook him on this show. He has yet to sort of respond to me. But that's that seems to be the, the gimmick or the blueprint for people on the left, though, Senator, where they don't like hearing something, even if it's factual, and the low-hanging fruit is, oh, let me just call so-and-so a homophobe and a transphobe. I'm none of those things. But I believe in – it's funny. I believe in science. I believe in biology. But it's funny when those that want to – infringe upon parental rights get to be sanctimonious about what's right and wrong senator at times it's it's just it's disgusting to me yeah look it it politics has gotten to a a, a pretty uh a contentious place yeah. and people argue it's been like that for you know generations it's it, we are in a weird place right now and yeah. i think we do have folks guilty by the way on the on the right and the left demonizing the folks on the other side and finding a need to hate people on the other side. Uh, that is not the way I like to do politics. 
I like nothing more than to get along with people that I disagree with. I disagree with Governor Murphy on a whole host of things. We've developed a, a decent relationship. There's areas where we're, we're going to work together. When he's right, I'll say so. Uh, same thing with the Attorney General, uh, Plotkin. Uh, happy to do that. Uh, but we see you've been a, a victim of it from folks on the left, uh, as have I. Uh, I know uh, a number of folks have been victimized by, by some folks on the right that are inclined to throw gasoline on these these fires and sure. encourage people to hate folks on the other side. Sure. And it really, it, it's a bad place that we've gotten to, especially if we're all intent on attracting the middle of the road, undecided swing voters. They don't like uh, I apologize, I did not see your, your post, uh, but you know, that's too bad if you're being victimized uh, in, that, in that way. Uh, I've seen now over this parental rights debate and parental in, in, uh, information debate, uh, folks on the, school, the Middletown School Board uh, being victimized as well, the Middletown attorney, he's a friend of mine. Uh, that's a shame because it's a real legitimate policy debate here. There's p points to be made on both sides uh, that is just lost in this melee and that sucks for for yeah. the making of good policy it works against the making of good policy absolutely uh so you didn't mention before obviously november 7th is around the corner and unlike other years i mean at the top of the ballot are all the legislative races and certainly there are local races such as council races let's say where i live nearby in hoboken there are council races there um nearby in other municipalities we have some county commissioner races uh, certainly, you know, um, taking place. So it's not the sexiest of election seasons, as they say. There's not, you know, next year will be very different. It's a presidential election year. There's a U.S. Senate race. Every uh, House seat will be up for grabs as well as, you know, in addition to other municipal races as also. But this is where I think Republicans can be smart. And, you know, I don't, listen, I'm not auditioning for a job. I'm pretty good in working in education and in media. But you know, one of the things that bothers me sometimes about the NJGOP is that the wind is at their back. And I'll sort of use a sports analogy here for all, you know, all, all us NFL fans that are just salivating at the mouth for the NFL to start in two weeks. But it's like they're running towards the goal line. They either get stopped at the goal line or fumble the ball. And at a time where Democrats in Trenton, far left, not all, far left Democrats are, they've never met a tax that they don't like. They love spending. They love acquiescing to a lot of woke nonsense, coddling illegals, whatever. I mean, I, I, don't have, I, I, don't, I don't have enough fingers and toes to name the behaviors, but this is a time where Republicans can really go after demographics like Hispanics, Blacks, suburban women, mothers, where, hey, look at these far-left Democrats. Look at some of these useless people in Trenton that push for a plastic bag ban and other things that just don't make sense and are hurting your pockets. The idea that, guess what? You're not even trying to roll back the gas tax, okay? Or other things that could make living in New Jersey more affordable, where people are mi migrating out to the great state of Florida, the great state of Texas, the great state of Georgia, because it's more affordable. You would think Republicans could capitalize on this. I'm just concerned, though, Senator, that it's not just enough to say, well, Democrats are bad in trend. We know what they do bad. We get it. It's about messaging. Do you, do you feel confident that your colleagues within the Republican Party can do that leading up to November 7th? I do. If you see the, uh, the gains we made in 2021, some of those unexpected, uh, and you mentioned Ed Durr, and people should tune in for that. He's, he's not only better looking than me, he's more entertaining and he's smarter. So uh, they'll, 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 they'll get their money's worth out of that show, uh, more so than this one. Uh, but I... Uh, we, we really are honing our message. Uh, and uh, look, and the Democrats are handing us, uh, are pitching to us softballs to continue your, uh, uh, your analogy. Uh, so I think we do uh, uh, have the ability, uh, the will and the skill to win this November, to exploit these, these issues that they are giving us virtually every day. Uh, so I think we do have it. And we're working hard to raise the money to make a difference in those swing districts. Uh, I am going to not take my district for, for granted. We're working hard here. But I also expect to raise money to help in those swing districts because, you know, a part of this job is is working to gain a majority in the legislature so we can really effectively do these jobs more so than simply being in the minority 
and really, you know, spending 10 times the effort uh, to get, you know, small gains. It would be really nice to be the majority uh, or much closer to it. So we're doing all that work. Senator, obviously you're focusing on your campaign coming up for November 7th to win re-election. I hope you win. You're a great public servant, obviously. I'm rooting for you. But I hear whispers, you know, 2025 is around the corner, as they say. And while, you know, there's one Democrat that's formally announced his candidacy for his party's nomination for governor, uh, no one has done that yet on the Republican side. We sort of just, it's a foregone conclusion that Jack Cittarelli uh, will run again in 2025. Um, I was the only journalist in New Jersey that actually called that race the way it was, as close as it was, because I knew that the emperor wasn't popular in a lot of pockets of the state. And again, I think if Republicans weren't so tribal and fickle, you know, at a margin of 39 percent of registered Republicans came out to vote. If, even if 10 percent more came out, I think we're talking about a different governor right now. We wouldn't be seeing these the horrible governing that right now is taking place in Trenton. Having said that, though, uh, I, I hear some whispers about, you know, the name Declan O'Scanlan for governor in 2025. Uh, something you want to tell me uh, here on the show, Senator? My, my, my typical response, that first off, I'm flattered, but my typical response is, may the state never be so desperate that it needs me to step up and run for governor. Uh, <laughs> it's flattering. I won't say that I don't have, you know, an aspiration there because my goal is policy oriented and to make the biggest impact on fixing New Jersey that possibly can during my career. Uh, someday that might be in the cards. Uh, I, I do love Jack Cittarelli. I adore him. He's a great guy. He's a great candidate. Uh, and, and ran a pretty good race last time out. I know, uh, you know I've heard some criticism, some uh, armchair uh, Monday morning quarterbacking, uh, but ran a good race, came closer than a lot of people uh, thought he had uh, the, the ability uh, or the, the likelihood of doing. Um, so we got to wait and see, but he's a good guy. And if he asked me to rally for him, I probably will do that. Uh, but, uh, you know, you never know. You got to wait and see how things work out. But you're right. Uh, it's apathy is our is our uh, worst enemy, and too many Republicans fell prey to that last time out. Uh, we can't let that happen again. Uh, Republicans have it within our grasp to win this state. We've done it before. Uh, we just need people to pay attention, show up, and help us get the job done. We're going to work really hard to encourage people to do that. Senator, well, there aren't any official names out there. Obviously, as I mentioned, it's a foregone conclusion, most likely that. Jack Chiarelli will run again for a third time and make an attempt. Uh, we've heard other names, such as radio uh, personality Bill Spadia. Uh, also, you know, should he win re-election like yourself, hopefully, on November 7th, you know, uh, State Senator Michael Testa. I've heard his name being floored around. Um, you know, do Republicans have maybe a messaging problem on a state level where someone like Bill Spadia, who I like personally, I like Bill, he's a friend of mine, he's been on this show, he'll be back on again soon, um, might lean too far to the right, where maybe someone like Jack is in the middle, maybe Michael Testa is center right. I mean, what do you think could be a winning formula for the gubernatorial race in 2025? Because again, you know, Democrats still have that advantage. They still have more registered Dems statewide, even though that gap is closing. Um, independents obviously decide elections all the time. But what, in 2025, aside from the legislative seats, what do Republicans have to maybe get right when it comes to running for governor? Again, a lot depends on next year, who's in the White House. I mean, God forbid, you know, Sleepy Joe wins re-election, but it's possible. You never know. Uh, we don't know who his opponent will, will be, most likely the 45th president. But a lot can happen next year. But for 2025, what do you think is a winning formula for Republicans after two terms of Phil Murphy that, in my opinion, as a homeowner, property tax you know, payer has been an outright disaster? It has. And if you look at the where New Jersey is, uh, a lot of our, our problems have been um, masked by uh, the, you know, the effects of COVID. Uh, we borrowed four billion dollars we didn't need that helped kick the can down the road on making some tough fiscal decisions. We got uh, billions and billions of dollars from the federal government that was borrowed from our children or grandchildren that they'll be paying back forever. That was some of it money that we didn't need that's added to the inflationary pressures, not the country. Uh, uh, but that's enabled this administration to kick the can down the road in fixing our, our, our what is going to revert back to be a dire fiscal situation. 
uh, and that that's luck for them, uh, but it doesn't bode well for the people of New Jersey, the taxpayers of New Jersey. So we have to be able to tell that story uh, and, and on all these other issues. And we can win. These are winning issues with the middle of the road, uh, you know, center, center right leaning voters of New Jersey. Uh, and yeah, look, we have to look at where our candidates are coming from. Uh, we can't win. Look, Republicans are never going to win by nine percentage points statewide. That's just not a luxury we're going to have in, like, in our lifetimes. We're going to win by one or two percentage points, maybe three if we're lucky. So we can't afford to not win over, unmask those middle of the road swing voters. We have to run people that are going to appeal to them. I'm, I'm a conservative. Uh, I you know, pride myself on that. Uh, but we also have to win elections and we have to uh, embrace policies that will attract those folks and make sure our messaging speaks to those people. So that those things have to be foremost when we're choosing candidates. Uh, otherwise, we'll, we'll squander this opportunity. Absolutely. So, Senator, before I let you go, obviously, you've been a gentleman to come on. Folks, it's 639 here on the East Coast. If you just join us live right now here on Real Talk, New Jersey First TV, my guest tonight is a distinguished state senator out of the 13th Legislative District all the way down near the Jersey Shore. My good friend Declan O'Scanlan joins us here on Real Talk. Senator, I know you mentioned, obviously, during the summer, and obviously, once the leaves start changing color, knocking on doors, everything else that goes along with campaigning. I know you touched upon some topics. Are there other issues within LD13 specifically that, again, should you win re-election, which I think you will, um, coming up on November 7th, once the new legislative session starts in January, what other areas in LD13 do you want to focus on? Is infrastructure an issue? Uh, any quality of life issues? What What do you want to focus on in addition to the aforementioned uh, issues that you already discussed here? Well, we, we did mention the center of the universe right now, as far as parental rights goes, is, is my district because Marlboro and Middletown are, are both falling. Um, aside from that, uh, you're right, infrastructure is always an issue. Uh, getting our fair share of available infrastructure money. We've worked very hard to ensure that we do, and we're, we're doing pretty well on that. We will run on, on, on those that recognition. Uh, but another issue that uh, particularly here has become uh, uh, at the forefront of people's thinking is, is safety, uh, public safety. Uh, yeah. We've had a rash of car thefts. We are uh, the center of the universe when, when, because the, the parkway runs straight down the spine of my district. We have had, in fact, while I was sitting right in this location in an interview just like this uh, two years ago, someone tried to steal the car out of my driveway here in Little Silver during the interview, uh, police out, it was, it was something. Uh, that is a real problem. Uh, it's a problem both because no one wants to lose their car. It's also a safety problem. Eventually, someone's going to run into one of these thugs who are stealing these cars, and there's going to be confrontation, and God knows what happens. Uh, look, the, most of these kids, and they are kids mostly, who are stealing these vehicles, uh, they're putting their lives at risk too. Now, I don't want folks to have backlash, but a lot of these, these young people are, are uh, lured into this business by gangs that use them because they're juveniles. Uh, they'll be killed too. So everybody on the left, the right, we need to care about this. Um, and in fact, uh, Governor Murphy lives in my district as well. And right across the street from his house, uh, they tried to break in and steal a car there too. It's a real problem uh, that we have to fix uh, some actions uh, of uh, the previous attorney general, uh, who I also liked and respected, but he was wrong to take them about pursuits. Uh, you know, we're, we're pretty left-leaning position saying police shouldn't bother to pursue at all, send an awful message to uh, the folks that are inclined to want to come and steal our cars. Uh, we have some work to do on bail reform, which substantial aspects of bail reform, but big parts of it have it. When someone, excuse my dog in the background, the, uh, the new interview at home uh, issues. Uh, but uh, there, there are certainly tweaks we can do. And we were advocating for that and leading the way here in D13 uh, to make sure that when you have repeat offenders, when you have people enter people's homes, uh, we need laws that dissuade them from doing those things uh, in the first place. Uh, laws that will, uh, if someone is a repeat offender, uh, really throw the book at them. There has to be a presumption that they're going to serve time. Uh, the, this revolving door can't 
be allowed to continue. It sends a terrible message to our cops, too. Uh, yeah. You know, you, you actually apprehend these guys and they're back on the street in no time. And guys that, you know, look, again, when they put people at risk, high speed chase, that is uh, uh, akin to not caring whether they kill someone. Uh, those folks can't be uh, back on the street uh, overnight. That can't happen. So there's a lot of work to be done on those fronts. And we're going to talk about that a lot during this campaign. It's funny when you mention that. I mean, you mean prosecutors or attorney general soft on crime? Nah, I would have never heard of that in New Jersey and New York, right? Oh, my God. Breaking news, folks. Water, wet. Um, it, it, it's true. Look, yes. uh, we have a new uh, prosecutor here in, in, in Monmouth County appointed by the governor who I think we're going to work really well with. He's not one of these who's inclined uh, to want to take every opportunity to not hold people accountable. Uh, and look, he happens to be in a county that leans Republican. But I think he's also sincere when he says that. So uh, there's there's a way to work with these folks uh, and and to agree on policy, uh, th th these policies. And we're working very hard to do that here in Monmouth County and then to export it to other counties as well. Uh, Senator, real quick here, what's your relationship like with Senate President uh, Nicholas Katari? I know that obviously before him, obviously you had it to some extent with uh, obviously, you know, Steve Sweeney. Uh, we know that uh, Nick Scatari is a very different guy than, than than Steve Sweeney. What's been your relationship like working in the Senate with him? Yeah, if you're going to be effective in the Senate on either side of the aisle, you have to figure out a way to to have these folks understand. I'm going to do my job. I'm going to I'm going to say loudly when I disagree with them. Uh, but then you have to be able to come together uh, and and work together uh, when you do agree. Uh, you know, or to have some leverage when they're on the fence, uh, you know, when you need a bill move that might not be the top of their, their list. And I formed that a very good relationship with Steve Sweeney over the years, and now I've formed the same sort of relationship with Nick Scatari. Uh, and look, we have, we fight, we fight uh, uh, in, in loud tones and piss each other off on a regular basis, but we can then uh, come back together and realize that each one of us can make the call to the other. Look, we have a thing called courtesy in the Senate, which is actually great policy, and a lot of people don't like it, but it gives a real level of relevance to, to those of us in the minority. Uh, and, I, you know, so I have some say over people that are going to move. Uh, the governor has people he wants to move, so does the Senate president. Uh, it gives a real reason for us to have uh, a dialogue and the ability to work together when we need to. So I've gotten there and I, you know, I'm sure that on a regular basis, uh, I'm pissing people off on the other side, including the Senate president. Uh, but we do find ways to, to genuinely like each other, get along and work together when, when uh, the job needs, when the job calls for it. That's really commendable. Real quick here. I, I want to know Declan O'Scanlan, the guy, uh, Yankees Mets. Uh, I come from, I'm one of the rare people. My grandfather was a Yankees fan. My mother was a Mets fan. I like them both. Sorry, that, I'm not trying to weasel out, but sure. I like them both. All right, fair enough. Giants or Jets? I'm a giant. I lean Giants, but I have a soft spot for the Jets. Uh, as downtrodden as they are, you can't you can't root against the Jets. Sure, uh, but I'm more a Giants guy. Look, uh, truth be told, I'm a Pittsburgh Steelers fan. Sorry to all my Jersey folks. Did I read you're a Cowboys fan? Oh, diehard member of Cowboy Nation, Senator Cowboy Nation. Uh, you're, you're 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 advocating. Uh, as seasons go, and I'm a big summer fan, and you're a Cowboys fan, Fernando, you're losing me quickly. But uh, thank God, uh, everything else I like you about. So, uh, but yeah, come on, man. The Cowboys really, uh, that was yeah. one of the flaws in, uh, in Governor Christie as well. That, you know, I mean, this close, it's just. Uh, that was the only it, thing I liked about Governor Christie. Well, he's a Cowboy. But other than that, I mean, there's not, not, not one good thing I could say about Chris. Uh, right now as it stands. Uh, I'll come on. I'll come on again. We'll talk about that a little bit. Definitely. Uh, Devils or Rangers or Islanders? I uh, look. Devils would be my top uh, of the list. Uh, I I enjoy hockey, but I'm not a sunken fan. Baseball and football are my sports. And and look, and soccer sucks. Let's agree. Can we agree on that? I love football. I mean, it's I'm Cuban and Colombian. I mean, I love football. Football. Yeah. I call it football. So it's I mean, soccer. <laughs> football is how Americans play. I'm sorry, but it's just no, and fair. I love taunting my soccer fans. Oh, no, that's there. fair. Uh, um, Senator, uh, a good bourbon or uh, beer? 
beer more than bourbon. Uh, I know wine very well uh, in my list of spirits. I, I'm not a brown drink drinker, actually. I like to sip it, smell it. I'm not an expert, and I don't okay. generally choose it. So uh, I'm, I'm assuming maybe you're more of a red wine guy like myself, Malbec, uh, Merlot, or Cabernet. What do you like? I, 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 I'm a cab, a cab fan, a Pinot Noir fan this time of the year. Uh, I like my whites, too. So okay. I'm a big fan of wine. like it. Very okay. much enjoy it and the culture of it. Senator, DC Comics or, or uh, Marvel? <sighs> tough choice, tough choice. I'd probably lean Marvel than DC. Okay, well, th that, folks, that right there is uh, Declan O'Scanlan, the man. I, it's definitely uh, very admirable. But, Senator, in all seriousness, thank you so much for joining us here tonight. It's been a great conversation. I really appreciate you taking the time after a busy day. I, obviously, you're out campaigning. I want to wish you the best of luck. I hope you win on November 7th. You're an amazing public servant. I love the battles you're picking because they're the right ones. And I certainly want to wish you and the rest of your ticket the best of luck. I certainly want to wish those two municipalities right now that seem to be in the crosshairs of the emperor and Maddie, uh, the attorney general right now, I want to wish them the best of luck, but uh, I appreciate you believing in Jersey first TV and real talk. Uh, I can't thank you enough. I'll give you the last word here tonight, Senator. Uh, look, just thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. And, and thank you for calling out Marlboro and, and Middletown, the board of education. These, these folks are volunteers, uh, not really intending to be the center of politics. And they've really suffered uh, because of the, the action the attorney general took. So rooting for them is the right thing to do. And I think they're right on the policy. Uh, and look, thank you for the, the call out uh, and good wishes to me and my running mates, Jerry Scharfenberger and Vicki Flynn, two great people, wonderful running mates, uh, working hard to make our constituents proud uh, that we serve them. So thank you, Fernanda, for having me on uh, and, uh, and, and wishing the good luck that I am hopeful that Republicans have this November. So thank you. Senator, go get them on November 7th. Keep that district red. And let's hope Jersey turns red in the legislature because, hey, nothing wrong with a little accountability for the emperor uh, and hopefully making the last two years of his term as uncomfortable as possible. But, uh, <laughs> Senator, I want to wish you the best of luck again. Ladies and gentlemen, he is State Senator Declan O'Scanlan out of the 13th Legislative District. Best of luck to you. And we'll see you again here, what, hopefully real soon, on Real Talk via Jersey First TV. Senator, best of luck to you. Thanks, Fernando. You too. Take care. Folks, great, great episode tonight with State Senator O'Scanlan, um, a guy who, listen, you couldn't talk about more perfect timing with everything going on right now as the academic year is starting on college campuses all across this, this country and, of course, in New Jersey. Uh, listen, the hell he's dying on when it comes to holding Rutgers University accountable is commendable, and I stand with him. And as I said, you couldn't get better timing on this show to have him on and to talk about really what Rutgers is doing and quite frankly, what they're doing poorly right now and the disservice they're doing to parents, to uh, their kids, to students all together. Um, you know, listen, uh, the fall, fall semester is a time for new beginnings, maybe new personal milestones and uh, to disenroll students, I think is wrong by Rutgers. And, um, you know, again, uh, kudos to state Senator Declan O'Scanlan for standing for parents for students against these absurd vaccine mandates at Rutgers University. So once again, I want to thank State Senator Declan O'Scanlan, who I want to wish the best of luck on November 7th. I hope he wins. I hope his ticket wins. And uh, let's try to turn the legislature red coming up on November the 7th. A lot of great districts in Central and South Jersey that should go red. And uh, I hope that they do. And that hopefully can maybe shift the tide a little bit and holding the emperor account. I'm sorry, excuse me, Governor Murphy accountable these last two years that thankfully he's only has left in office here in the state of New Jersey. Folks, before we call it an evening, you know what time it is. Yes, folks, it's time for final thoughts. And ladies and gentlemen, I know that last week I went into uh, a pretty good monologue. Uh, some that didn't rub some people the right way, apparently. Um, some callbacks or some phone calls made out to me. Uh, some uh, getting blocked on Twitter, which I thought was really interesting, by uh, very, uh, I don't know, easily triggered leftists in New Jersey media. And uh, I just got to continue with it this week. Again, as we know, it is August the 28th. Uh, a lot of college campuses begin their fall semester today. I know Rutgers, the State University, 
uh, will begin after Labor Day, as it usually does. I remember my days uh, living in New Brunswick during my undergraduate studies. And of course, during my graduate studies at Rutgers in Newark, I remember, you know, that fall semester was always, uh, you know, change of seasons, get to, you know, see some old classmates I didn't see since the summer. And it's always a prosperous time, but that's not the case at my alma mater in New Brunswick and even all the campuses in New Jersey, where Rutgers University continues to do a disservice to its students. And last week, okay, I made a point to go after, you know, some journalists or more propagandists here in the state of New Jersey who, for whatever reason, think this isn't a good story to cover. Well, we know that the Science University of New Jersey, Rutgers, right, would have a better scientific perspective about vaccines. And that's not the case at Rutgers University, where they're just enrolling students for continuing to enforce a vaccine mandate. Okay. Now, as you can see there on the screen, ladies and gentlemen, obviously I went from, you know, the number grew a little bit here. Okay. So quite frankly, where the nonsensical nine should be doing their jobs. And unfortunately, I'm the only grown up in the room. I have to do their jobs for them. Okay. Now, yes, you know, I like to pick on <laughs> Matt Freeman. Uh, I mean, you look at him I mean, Jesus Christ. I mean, I've never seen a grown man get so giddy about picking up a kitten. But I mean, I don't know if that's the amount of, well, all right. I could use another word that he only gets on a regular basis, but we'll see. But in any event, you know, nice of Matt Freeman to address this issue barely last week, only because of his disenchantment with Bill Spadia. Uh, what a surprise, you know, next week, this week, obviously, uh, the New Jersey playbook on political will not be reporting this week. I mean, wow, he's off another week. I mean, it seems like Matt Freeman's always off, really. Uh, you know, listen, the guy that works maybe one day a week, publishes a story one day a week. I mean, <laughs> is it too much to ask, Matty? to maybe, you know, call out Rutgers. I mean, you're very opinionated on your Twitter feed, right? Which I don't follow because I have no use to, you know, I have no use for it, quite frankly. I don't want to lose brain cells reading some of the gibberish that you espouse. But of course, you know, screenshots get sent to me and whatever. And okay, I mean, listen, last week you decided to call out Bill Spadia for what he feels is unfair about Rutgers. And again, as State Senator O'Scanlan very clearly articulated tonight, Rutgers is, is, is hiding behind this awful policy. And for someone like you who always has an opinion on everything, for someone like you that likes to call out, I don't know, the establishment and what's, you know, being done wrongly against the little people, Matt, why aren't you staying up for parents and kids and students at Rutgers who are being disenrolled for this nonsensical vaccine mandate? I get it. You're in your house up in the, in the woods, up in, you know, like two hours away in upstate New York, you know, petting kittens and scratching cats or cats scratching you. I get it. This isn't this story isn't important to you, but it's important to a lot of uh, people. And you would think that for a guy that barely does anything during the week, right? Other than I don't know, blowing a load on himself of, on Twitter, you would think that you would be focusing on this story, Maddie. But again, Matt, that would require you to be working, and we all know that that's something you struggle with more than one day a week, right? Or the other members of the nonsensical nine that you see there, you know, hey, Terrence McDonald. You would think for a guy that is as opinionated as Terrence McDonald. Right. You would think that he and he's always about, oh, calling out bad government or bad policies. Right. You would think that Terry would be calling out Rutgers University, but that's not the case. Right. I'm pretty sure Terrence is thinking, well, you know, it's 10 months until next year's Pride Month. You know, hmm, what can I think about how victimized or how oppressed I am as a gay man in New Jersey? Yes, because, you know, as he's thinking about Pride Month 10 months from now, hmm, that's probably seems to be more important on his radar than, I don't know, calling out bad policies by the state university. Once again, Terrence, a publicly funded university, right? That gets subsidized with tax dollars. But again, you'd rather bitch and moan about how bad you have it as a gay man in New Jersey when we all know you don't have it badly here. But again, that would require Terrence to have some integrity, that pesky four-syllable word, which we all know that, that Terrence doesn't have. Because he, like, he likes to pick and choose when to be outraged about something, Terrence, you should be outraged about this. This is affecting parents. This is affecting students. Okay? You should be outraged for them. Okay? Not worrying about what's going to happen in 10 months when it's Pride Month again. Right? Speaking of useless, well, folks, let's just sort of go down the uh, the chart there. Alan Steinberg, who 
I guess after a while, I had to block me on Twitter, right? Because again, when we talk about useless journalists, we talk about guys that aren't intellectually honest and philosophically consistent. For a guy that, 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 that loves, to, again, like Terrence, loves to call out bad government and how certain people are oppressed and standing up for people. No, Ali. And I know, again, it's seven o'clock right now. So it's way past your bedtime, right? Because it's seven o'clock. So we all know what Alan Steinberg is doing, right? He's sleeping, and I'm sure he'll watch the replay tomorrow. Because, he, again, he loves watching this show. For as much as Alan Steinberg hates me and likes to write about me uh, and vilify me, he loves watching the show. But, again, back to the point at hand. You would think that an issue like this, affecting parents, affecting their children, affecting students, maybe going back to school after so many years, and they choose not to be vaccinated. Like myself, I'm not vaccinated. I'm never going to be vaccinated. You're going to have to drag me to jail to get me vaccinated because I refuse to. Okay. And I'm not going to be vilified and I'm not going to be, I don't know, made an example of because that's not who I am. But someone like Alan Steinberg who believes in standing up for little people, right? You would think that this would be a cause that's on his radar. Of course not. That would require Ali, besides being awake, to have folks, wait for it, that four syllable word, integrity. We all know Alan Steinberg doesn't have it, all right? Speaking about not having integrity, let's move on to Chucky. Charles Style, who, again, Chuck, (laughs) bravo to you, bro, bravo. You actually left your house a few weeks ago to go to Middletown, uh, I guess, obviously, during the parental rights rally. I'm happy to see you there on camera, actually leaving your house and doing some actual physical work, right, other than bitching and moaning about Donald Trump, which is all you live for, on your columns, which folks, let's be honest, nobody reads. Okay. NorthJersey.com, just like NJ.com, is begging you for one dollar to subscribe to their premium content. Folks, it's not even worth one cent. But again, you wouldn't know that from Charles Style. For a story like and for a guy who should be covering your story like this, because again, Charles Style, like the aforementioned, love to bitch and moan when government is wrong, when government is infringing on people, right? You would think that Chucky would want to talk about this, right? Because, you know, Chucky, like all the other left-wingers here on the screen, we're all bitching and moaning about the the Dobbs decision last summer, right, about reproductive rights and my body, my choice. Yeah, where were all you clowns when it comes to people like me and others that were vilified for saying my body, my choice about vaccines, right? Charles was nowhere to be found, okay? He disappeared quicker than... You know, Ali Steinberg's New York Mets or Brooklyn Nets. Okay. But again, bravo, Chuck, leaving the house for the first time in God knows how long to do some actual physical work. Bravo, bro. But again, you would think that someone like like Chucky would be rallying behind parents. No, he'd rather vilify parents for going to board of ed meetings and standing up for their parental rights. Again, that pesky four syllable word for Chucky, integrity. He doesn't have it either. Speaking about not having integrity and barely doing any work, how about Max Pizarro? Yes, another guy who barely leaves his house right down the shore, right? You won't see him at any events, right? He'll send whoever to do work for him, right? And of course, you would think that an operation like Insider NJ, right, who, again, whores themselves out for money for advertising dollars at every single turn, okay? Like, just check your clock. Oh, yeah, that's Pete Onelia whoring himself out for advertising dollars. Right? But Max Pizarro is no better. You would think a story like this that affects parents, that affects their kids, that affects students of all walks of life, you would think that this is something that Insider NJ would cover. Of course not. They're more concerned with coddling the NJEA, right? Or Planned Parenthood, or coddling useless activists that they put on their power list that serve no purpose. We all know who they are, right? Patty Campos Medina. Amy Torres, useless women like that, and other useless activists. But that's who they'd rather glorify and sort of give, you know, props to and give a spotlight to. But for parents and their kids who are being wrongfully disenrolled, right, as the fall semester begins, and this is wrong by Rutgers, you would think that Maxi would be writing about this. Again, that would require having integrity, that pesky force a little more. All right? Of course, you know, never mind Jay Lasseter who, I guess, thinks it's more important to take selfies in front of a mirror 
than writing about stories that matter to New Jersey residents, right? And for a guy that I, I mean, it's funny, for a guy that vilifies conservatives as much as he does, bro, you spent an awful amount of time in Florida, right? A, a state that's well run by a very good governor like Ron DeSantis, unlike here, right, where property taxes are on the rise, our budget is getting fatter than the latest Victoria's Secret models that they're hiring, right? The gas tax is still in effect. We coddle illegals, right? We acquiesce to all the woke nonsense. But Jay loves doing that. Right? And for a guy that vilifies conservatives as much as Jay Lasseter, man, bro, you, you love spending time in Florida. Mm, again, integrity. It requires having some. We know he doesn't. And speaking about not having integrity, again, sort of sticking along the lines of Insider and Jay, how about Herb Jackson and Bob Henley? Folks, two guys, when you, li- when you listen to them, will put you to sleep. Bob Henley, again, blocked me on Twitter some time ago because he doesn't like to be called out on his BS, on his nonsense. And for a guy that's always about unions and the little people and people that are marginalized, where's Bob Henley? Stand up for parents, right? Where's Bob Henley? Stand up for students. He's nowhere to be found, okay? Nowhere to be found. Where's Herb Jackson from Roll Call? Another propagandist that Insider likes to glorify, right? When you look at that news site, yes, they're more concerned about, I don't know, bitching and moaning about how trans people have it so badly. I mean, folks, it's nonsense. But again, ladies and gentlemen, this is what you can come to expect from the nonsensical nine. And when I think about watching the news feed, reading it, seeing what's being covered in our news, folks, Every time I see any of these virtue singlers being all sanctimonious and being all so virtuous in what they want to cover, what they think is important, folks, we all know when it comes to them, we all know what it looks like, folks. It looks like. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, it is exactly that. It is looking at a bunch of clowns being sanctimonious, being virtuous, and sort of picking and choosing when they want to stick up for people, for marginalized people, because you would think that people that are not vaccinated, are, that we know are being vilified right, by these science guys, right, who have no problem vax shaming people, because I know what it's like to be vax shamed. I lived it. You know what I'm saying? So the idea that the nonsensical nine would rather focus on Trump derangement syndrome and other nonsense that they espouse on their Twitter feed or on Facebook or Instagram or whatever. You would think that a story as important as this would be covered. You would think a story as important as this where we should be holding President Holloway accountable and the administration at Rutgers accountable for a bad policy. You know what? None of the nonsensical nine are anywhere to be found because we know the vaccine mandates are wrong. But as I said, ladies and gentlemen, that requires integrity, that force of word, integrity. And we all know when it comes to the nonsensical nine, ladies and gentlemen, we all know none of them have it, which is why when we see them opining on social media, once again, this is what they look like. Yes, folks, that's exactly that. It's a clown show. But what else would you expect from so many left-wingers in the New Jersey media echo chamber? It's a shame, folks. It really is, because at the end of the day, those suffering are parents, their kids, and students all together. And what is supposed to be the State University of New Jersey, the Science University of New Jersey, now, folks, it's become a joke of a university. And that pains me to say that because I'm such a devoted Rutgers alumnus. It's a shame, folks. I'm the only one really talking about this. I'm the only grown up in the room as opposed to these children right behind me. It's a shame, folks. Well, that's the difference between adults and children. Adults talk about the issues and children just sort of, I don't know, play with themselves and play around and not and choose not to be serious. That's what we're seeing here with the nonsensical night. And that's our show for this week, ladies and gentlemen. Again, you know, shame on Rutgers University and shame on what they're doing because, quite frankly, 
at a time where we should be, I don't know, enjoying the fall semester, where we should be, you know, celebrating our kids going back to school or starting school for the first time. We should be celebrating this. We should be celebrating this time, not disenrolling them. And it's a shame that I'm the only adult in the room standing up for kids, standing up for parents, okay? Because it's certainly not these guys. Yeah, if you want to pick and choose when to be sanctimonious and virtuous, we all see through your BS, guys. I know I do, and so do the thousands of people that watch this show. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank State Senator Declan O'Scanlan for a very lively interview today. Certainly one of our better public servants and elected officials in the Jersey State Legislature. But before I call it a night, folks, you know, a new follower on Instagram sent me uh, this photo. And it really sort of, I think, summarizes the way I look at all the haters online and all the traffic I get. Right. And it's interesting because tons of people hate me in not just Hudson County, but New Jersey. But you know what the funny thing is? They can't stop watching on Monday nights. And uh, to borrow a quote from the late, great Kobe Bryant, who arguably is probably on the Mount Rushmore of the NBA, a guy who left us too soon in January of 2020. But when I was sent this quote, and someone said to me, Fernando, this is perfect for you because it really describes the haters and the people that vilify you but keep on watching. And to quote Kobe Bryant, haters are a good problem to have because nobody hates the good ones they hate the great ones. Well, folks, if my traffic is any indication and the awards and the accolades and everything else is any indication, well, quite frankly, folks, if they're hating anybody, it's one of the great ones. That's right, folks. Fernando Uribe. So to all you haters, keep on watching on Mondays because I just know you can't help yourselves. That's our show for this week, ladies and gentlemen. Once again, check out all of our great social media. Make sure you like us on Facebook, of course. Follow us on Instagram and Twitter. Don't forget to subscribe to the Jersey First YouTube page and wherever you get your podcasts on Spotify or SoundCloud. Download Jersey First and take it with you with really what's left of the summer months here, the summer days, as they say, whether you're visiting your in-laws, helping to move your kids back on campus, maybe uh, going to Tiki Mondays with, with what's left of the summer. Hey, maybe just taking a trip down to Atlantic City, Ocean City, wherever, folks. Download it from the PC, Mac, smartphone, or tablet, and take Jersey First with you anywhere and everywhere that you go. I can't say enough how proud I am to be on the dream team of Jersey Media. Obviously, here, it's always Jersey First TV, ladies and gentlemen. Brand new episodes of the Nader Narrative premiere every Thursday, hosted by the incredible Elizabeth Nader, and brand new episodes of Bridging the Gap with Millennial Conservatives, AJ Malilo and Simi Rambolo, also premiere on Thursdays, via jerseyfirst.org slash TV, as well as the Jersey First Facebook page, also on Instagram and Twitter, as well as on LinkedIn and also on YouTube. And of course, you can check out brand new episodes of Real Talk every Monday night here on Jersey First TV. Folks, special programming note, next Monday is Labor Day. We will not be having a show again, folks. New Jersey's premier journalist needs a break once in a while. And since I haven't taken any time off this summer, really, Hey, it's a well-deserved break as we close out the summer. Special programming again next Tuesday, September the 5th, ladies and gentlemen. I have two guests on, Sussex County Commissioner Candidate Jack DeGroot and also Moms for Liberty, Bergen County Chapter Chair. Alexandra Brewer will be on the program. A lot to discuss about parental rights, you know, election day coming up on November the 7th. All that and much more, folks, next Tuesday, September the 5th. Mark it on your calendars again as we'll be off next Monday for Labor Day. Folks, I cannot say enough. Thank you so much for supporting Jersey First TV and Real Talk, of course. Please party responsibly. Have a great rest of your summer. Enjoy it. See family, friends. Party responsibly, as I said, ladies and gentlemen. Enjoy it as the fall is right around the corner. Always remember, if it's unbiased, unfiltered, and unafraid, it's always Real Talk right here with Jersey First TV. I am New Jersey's premier award-winning journalist, Top 50 Latino as Vardam by the Latino Spirit Online Magazine. Certainly the weapon of mass disruption in Garden State Media. Yes, I've heard the people's choice and the people's voice. And of course, 
the most handsome face that runs the place. That's right. It's Fernando Uribe saying so long, everybody. Enjoy the rest of your holiday weekend. Always remember, if you can't be good, be bad, baby. Enjoy Labor Day. We'll see you next Tuesday night here for Real Talk via Jersey First TV. Have a great night, everybody.